Well, well, welcome back to another episode of Joyride. What's going on, Adam? Hey, it's another sunny summer day out there. It's not. It's under 100, so we're doing better this yeah, time. The last time we did this, it felt kind of like the beginning of Weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> yeah, to say the least. <laughs> okay, so I before we really get into the the, uh, the main script here, I, I, have, I have a small story I want to tell you beforehand. We're, we're going to call this a mini Joyride, okay? <laughs> so, and this actually happened on my way to our recording session. So... Left the house, you know, it's early morning, okay? I don't eat a lot of fast food, but I was like, you know what sounds really good right now is a sausage egg McMuffin. So I, I was going to grab you one too. So I pull in there at the McDonald's, and there's not a lot of cars, but it's moving really slow. Now, I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty chill guy, so I didn't, it didn't really bother me. I just sat there. I left early. I know it's going to get to our session in time. And finally, I get up to the, the menu, and this person who's working there, zero personality, okay, obviously really, really does not want to be at work today. And eventually I go, and then he goes, okay, well, well, well what would you like? And I went, I'll take two uh, sausage Jake McMuffins. He goes, oh, we're not doing breakfast. I'm like, and I'm thinking this myself, I was like, it's the morning. Why? <laughs> well, Where's the cutoff? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I was like, "Well, okay, okay. Well, um, let me think here." He goes, "Okay, I suppose you can take your time." I'm like, "Oh, okay." Well, and eventually, I just gave up. I just went uh, two, just two hamburgers, uh, okay. And then he's like, "Okay." And so I get up there. The guy looks as boring as his voice. I'd like to point out. <clears throat> it takes another ten minutes, no joke, from the pay window to the pickup window, and there's only two cars in front of me. So uh, this whole thing, I've de- sat there for 20 minutes, <laughs> dealt with crappy service, didn't get breakfast. I now know kind of what Michael Douglas felt like at the in falling down. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm justifying his actions, but I kind of get it now. <laughs> it gives you an inkling of what built him up to that breaking point in that movie, which, when, which made that was one of the most, I think, if not the most uh, recognizable iconic scenes of falling down. Yeah. Anyway, the rest of the drive went great. So and uh, so that was a, it was a very very good uh, uh, mini joyride, other than the uh, the burger incident. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thankfully you made it the rest of the way, and you're not stuck out there uh, no. with SWAT team on you. Know, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> All right, burgers aside. Okay, are you ready for our main uh, story for the day? Well, let's hit it. Okay, open up the script here. All right, so. Uh, the little hint I gave last time is this is going to be a very early automobile. It's not a Model T. All right. Okay. The dawn of the automotive industry would not begin easily. It would take years of hard work and determination, along with plenty of strifes and struggles, that would all come with the ride. There had been many early attempts to build a self moving vehicle, but it would take a brilliant inventor and his daring wife to work together in order to build the world's first automobile. On the 25th of November, 1841, Carl Frederick Benz was born in the town of Mühlberg in what is the cur- current, what is currently the German state of Brandenburg. Now, there's going to be a lot of German in here, which I'm going to completely probably butcher. So, just <laughs> <laughs> no, don't get mad at me, please. <laughs> I'll try not to with my German heritage. <laughs> okay. I'll set it aside. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. As a youth, Carl was not interested in the typical licentious pastimes of most young men, but was instead fascinated by the art of locksmithing. Interesting. 
It's like, hey, what you want to you want to go out to the bar tonight with the boys? No, I'm just gonna play with my locks. So. <laughs> <laughs> Forget that. <laughs> I've got more entertaining things to do. <laughs> Um, being interested in mechanical things in general, he eventually attended the University of Karlsruhe to study engineering. After graduating from university, he found a job designing scales for a nam- man named Karl uh, Scheinick. I'm um, the, the scales I, are like for weight. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, as important as weighing equipment may be to the world of commerce, Karl soon began uh, to become bored with this work. The next phase of his career would be working as an engineer for a bridge-building company owned by the Beckninsker brothers. But even something as sturdy as the bridge business was not enough for the fledgling inventor. <clears throat> as Carl was looking for a new avenue in his professional life, his personal life was also about to get much better. During this period, Carl would meet a girl who would eventually become his wife, Cecile Bertha Ringer, better known as Bertha. Now, if you look up a picture of Bertha Ben, she does not look like a Bertha. <laughs> not, not the rounded, I guess, shape no, you would imagine no, it's naturally, not, especially not, for the era. It, no, yeah. Yeah. After in getting, ga- getting engaged with Bertha, Carl began a business partnership with August Ritter. They formed a company called Gas Motoren Fabrik Mannheim. Oh, Rolls off the tongue. It does. <laughs> Ritter would prove to be a bad business partner, and Bertha had to dip into her dowry in order to buy out Ritter's shares of the company. The shenanigans of Ritter would not be a major setback, however. At this time, Carl had completed one of his first major accomplishments. The invention itself was a two-stroke internal combustion engine. He uh, received a patent for it on June 28, 1880. Carl originally wanted to build a four-stroke engine, but discovered he had been beat to the punch a few years earlier by a rival inventor, Nicholas August Otto, who had been granted a patent for a four-stroke engine in 1877. Now, the engines they were both building were used to power different kinds of machinery for a multitude of different industries. So <clears throat> they weren't they, they hadn't been they hadn't thought of fitting it to a vehicle or a carriage yet. So it's like it's powering like looms and that kind of thing. Sure, is yep. what they're working on. Yeah, stationary equipment, yep. things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Carl took on more partners to help find more financing for his company. One of his new partners was a local photographer named Emil Bueller, and Emil's brother would also join the company. Carl worked on building the engines, and Emil took care of the sales side of the business. These two employees would prove to be valuable assets to the workshop, but Carl would also bring another partner on board, Otto Schmuck. Interesting last name. <laughs> I guess back then, maybe uh, not uh, funny, but uh, uh, <laughs> needless to say, we know I, what we're thinking. I don't, yeah. In German, I don't know if you pronounce it different, but at least in English, it just looks like Schmuck. Schmuck. <laughs> <laughs> Otto would prove to be an unreliable partner by regularly spending far more money than he should have, which of course caused the company financial problems. So Schmuck was an appropriate name for him. <laughs> <laughs> they would end up having to go to various banks in Mannheim to acquire more capital. The relationship between Carl and his other main investors began to worsen when he told them he wanted to build a horseless carriage that was going to be powered by his stationary engine. Uh, the board and the investors and all his partners thought that a horseless carriage was impossible and that Carl, quote, was insane. How dare you think of something outside of those living beasts that transport us reliably and have for many years? Well, I, I think uh, Henry Ford said, if I would have gave people what they wanted, I just would have gave them faster horses. <laughs> yeah, sure, back then. And they would have been happy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Carl did not take this kindly. And in 1883, he left Gas Motorin Fan Fabrik Mannheim. What a name. <laughs> Thanks for not good for him at this time. And he even said, quote, During those days when disaster struck on the sea of life, only one person was waiting on my side. That was my wife. Fearless and courageous, she hosted up new sails of hope. Well, good they have the inspiration there. That's a lot much better than the um, uh, text messages you, you send your sweetheart now, I think. Oh, my God. <laughs> Worlds away yeah. from where we're at today. Thankfully, Carl would find hope again when he revisited an old hobby of his, cycling. This brought him to a bicycle repair shop owned by Mask Kesper Rose, 
Max Kesper Rose, and Frederick Wilhelm Eblinger. Now, I love how the first guy has a relatively normal name, and the second guy is horribly German. <laughs> Yeah. Max Kasparov's Frederick Wilhelm yeah. Ebenlinger. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, the three of them together would eventually form a new company. Are you ready for this one? Ready for it. Called Bins and Company Rheinschei Gas Motorin Fabrik. Whoa, <laughs> that's a mouthful. Better known as Bins and Company. <laughs> You know, when they couldn't figure out what to say, they just said it all, I guess. It's like back those then. it's like those old books, like those non fiction books like scholars would write, <clears throat> or even just like snake oil salesmen, I guess it doesn't really matter. But like in the eighteen eighties they have these long titles. You ever notice that? Yes, that's true. It's like the theories of wind, you know, colon and the different prepositions and propositions <laughs> of air velocity. And it just keeps going and going and going. going. Yep. <laughs> Man. I guess they just had time for that back then. I don't know. Once again, the main product on offer were Carl's stationary engines. Despite the negative of opinions of his past investors, the dream of a horseless carriage was still on his mind. There was one problem, however. His stationary engines were extremely heavy, which meant it was not practical to power an apparatus that was intended to be continually on the move. <clears throat> the inspiration for this problem unexpectedly came from a fire in Mannheim. The fire was started when a bowl of benzine was ignited by a wayward spark. Benzine is a chemical solution that was used to remove stains from gloves, but as the fire had proven, it was also highly flammable when not used responsibly. Oh, discovery by accident. Mm -hmm. Carl thought benzene would be a key to making his engines more practical if he could control the, ver the veracity of its explosive nature. With this new spark of creativity, he got to work and was more determined than ever. As a way of controlling the explosion, Carl invented the Trembler coil system that used a spark plug, which he'd also just invented. Oh, interesting. Now, for those who are not very familiar with how internal combustion engines work, what does that spark plug do, Adam? So that spark plug essentially just transfers the energy produced by the distributor and or ignition coil combination um, or magneto, you know, for that matter. So where the par spark is produced, it transfers it into the combustion chamber to, igni to ignite the uh, air fuel mixture um, is what it does. And that explosion pushes the piston down, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that explosion then pushes the piston down, which is your power stroke out of your four-stroke engine. Yep. And so that's where the stroke comes from. Mm -hmm. Now, he, the, the, he also later, you know, in, kind of during this period, you know, Mercedes, the company and whatnot, they also um, basically developed the carburetor. And a lot of cars don't use carburetors anymore. They're electrically fuel injected. But what would the carburetor do? So the carburetor, uh, it actually operates off the four-stroke cycle. So uh, as we just explained, the uh, power stroke, which is uh, produced when the spark plug ignites, um, before that, uh, when the intake stroke takes place, um, that produces vacuum. And the carburetor has what is called a Venturi inside. And when that intake stroke produces vacuum, it then moves the air-fuel mixture through because it actually contains fuel in the carb itself and then sucks outside air in causing that air fuel mixture to be brought in the combustion chamber and then boom brought up and ignited it's all right uh yeah no yeah that, that's perfect yeah so we got, we got to think of a name for this section um i don't know i know, know, know it all with adam i don't know <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure something out <laughs> all right at the same time gottlieb daimler and wilhelm maybach were also working on motor cars of their own in Germany. Oddly enough, none of them were, were aware of each other. <clears throat> wow. I know, right? I, you know, I guess that's another point of this, how transparent everything is today, where, you know, everything just, information travels so fast, these guys were oblivious to their existence. Yeah. Well, I guess, you know, kind of more contemporary or more recent when you can compare it to is kind of like Apple and Microsoft. Oh, yeah. You know, about, you know, mid-70s, you know, you got Bill Gates and Paul Allen and Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. They're both working on some type of new personal computer, which basically doesn't really exist at this point. Totally unaware of each other, and they're doing it in completely different ways on top of it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
One of the more troubling decisions that Carl had to make was whether his car should have three wheels or four wheels. Oh, yeah, because of the carriage designs back mm-hmm. in the day. After careful thought, he settled on three wheels. He came to this decision because one less wheel would make the car lighter and easier to steer. He'd also invent his own tiller system to steer the car. Now, I love how that he thinks is great because he was like, what, the Reliant Robins? You know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. Those, those things are notorious for always rolling. Oh. <laughs> well, that and you think back to the uh, you know early 1983 Honda three-wheelers. You know? yeah. I mean, it's just the design. <laughs> yeah, you got to put the wheel in the back. You know what, they did? You know what Bombardier did with that Can-Am thing? Yes, yeah. yes. Which basically, you know, a call back to our last episode, that thing's just basically a snowmobile with wheels. <laughs> when you look at it. <laughs> it is, uh, but it's just kind of wild to see those. But, they, yeah. I mean, they work. Yeah. The design works. Yeah. yeah. With the wheel and steering system in place, the power plant, of course, was the next major step to make the car a reality. Times had changed in the engineering world, and he was now able to use a four-stroke engine that used his revolutionary ignition system. The engine would sport the ferocious output of 0.9 horsepower, though not even a whole horse. Like a horse with three legs. <laughs> it really makes you think on, uh, again, when this stuff was just first being developed, I mean, how, <laughs> what one horsepower really is and how much power that is. You know, what one horse yeah. could do and how we base everything today. Yeah. This gave it the blistering top speed of 10 miles per hour. <laughs> Man. Hold on to your hat. Well, I guess Beats walking is... (laughs) Well, yeah, and and you think back then, I mean, how uh, primitive, you know, roadways were, dirt, paths. I mean, it's not... We take a lot for granted today Mm -hmm. how developed we are, (laughs) you know. To add to all this excitement, it only had one gear. With all the important concepts and innovation in place, testing would begin at the Benz workshop. The initial trials actually went very well until the drive chain snapped. Once the drive train was fixed, they set out again for another round of tests. On the next occasion, Carl would have Bertha sitting next to him as one of his assistants spun the flywheel in order to start the car. The engine exploded to life and Carl and Bertha were off. The car was cruising at an exciting pace and all was going well until they slammed into the brick wall of the workshop. <laughs> oh <my gosh. laughs> forgot about brakes. <laughs> That's probably exactly so. Oh, damn it, I forgot the brakes. <laughs> well, and it's quite the, you know, you try to put an image there uh, tied to, you know, someone having to physically grab a flywheel and turn that and let go because that was an issue back, yeah. you know. We're talking back to the old crank days with the Model T. Is uh, there was a lot of accidents where people did not let go of that crank in break time. Break arms and, and stuff. Break arms, yeah. wrists, yeah. Oof. yeah. And you know, this is the other thing I was thinking when I was writing this is that this, since this is te- technically the first car, this is the first car accident. No, you, you know, that's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> that would be, and how appropriate with the setting, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, the wall incident proved the engine was doing its job, but there was one other small problem. And no, it was not the brakes. <laughs> Carl had yet to fit a fuel tank to his car. Oh, wow. So how did they manage to conduct their testing? Carl enlisted one of his sons to run alongside the vehicle as he poured fuel into the engine so it did oh, not stop my. running. <laughs> try again, try to put that image in your head. I mean, and back in that era. One, okay, first of all, child labor laws. That never happened, but you have, I don't know how old his son was at the time, let's just say nine. He's got this nine-year-old kid running along this exploding thing with this very explosive liquid. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> Pouring it in by hand. Well, and you know, we automatically think of all the safety hazards associated yeah. with that, but that was so new back then, they didn't make those connections because, you know, you hadn't played around or experimented no, with that no, stuff. No, enough. I'm not saying they're being reckless. I just, <clears throat> it's just, it's just amazing. Oh, it is. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> As development continued, a fuel tank was added, and the car was now fully functioning. Despite having an impressive prototype, Carl was apprehensive to put the car into production, even though it had been approved for a patent on January 29, 1886. It had gone through a considerable amount of testing, but all these tests were done outside of the workshop and not on actual roads. In order to give Carl a little more confidence in his invention, Bertha would take matters into her own hands. 
1888, Bertha left a note to Carl saying that she and the boys took to go- the car to go see her parents who lived in the town of Farsheim. Farsheim. <laughs> 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 Again, we're doing best as we can with the pronunciations. I, I Nonetheless, it, it, it create interesting name. Yeah. yeah, there's probably some guy in Germany listening. Like, You're not saying it right. Uh, sorry. Yeah, we'll have an entire <laughs> section of comments, uh, comment vlog separate from this broadcast, yeah. so you can express your concerns. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the town was about 100 kilometers or 60 miles for those who don't live in the civilized world uh, <laughs> from the workshop. <laughs> This would be the world's first joyride. Wow. The trip went relatively smooth, and Bertha only had to t- had to stop a few times to fix some minor problems. By early afternoon, her and the boys had reached Heidelberg and stopped to have a bite of lunch. I, I like how she's... This is almost, It's like, it literally is. She's just going out for a jaunt, and she's doing something that's never been done before. Yeah, I mean... It, and you think of how historic that is, but back then, I mean... I don't know, maybe she didn't realize what she was doing. I don't, uh, I don't know. Didn't, uh, didn't but uh, it makes you really think. Yeah. Yeah, in the moment. Um, they left the town of Heidelberg and continued on their way until Bertha realized the car was low on fuel. She pulled into Weisslach, where she popped into a local pharmacy in order to purchase the stain remover that powered the engine. The pharmacy is considered to be the world's first fuel station. Wow. <clears throat> And it really would be, you mm-hmm. know. I mean, that's <laughs> unknowingly. <laughs> uh, there are only two other problems that occurred during her historic joyride. At one point, the fuel line had become block, blocked. Bertha fixed the problem by clearing out the line with her hairpin. With fuel traveling back to the engine, they continued on their way. Another mishap occurred when the brake belt failed. She quickly fixed this with a piece of leather she acquired in the town of Boschloft. So she's MacGyvering. All, all the, she is already. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's impressive. I yeah. mean, you have a, a brand new invention, essentially, and you're already being intuitive and creative on you know ways to repair it on the go. Mm-hmm. Aside from all this, at one point, the ignition wire short-circuited while driving. Bertha pulled the car over again and assessed the problem. With some quick thinking, she fixed the ignition wire by tearing up her garters so the wire would become functional again. Oh, so she fixed the car with her lingerie, essentially. Again, another interesting <laughs> fact, and uh, not to get technical again, but with the you know, electrical and how electricity works, it finds goes with the path of least resistance. So she provided some of the first insulators then, yeah, you know? basically. Yeah, to yeah. keep that under control and mm-hmm. the spark going where it should. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we can think, yeah, we have modern ignition systems thanks to underwear. <laughs> In one form, yes. I mean, that's that's, that's crazy to think about that, but yeah. there we go. That's our something of yep. underwear, right? Yeah. Um, by the end of the day, they would reach their destination. Bertha would later write that father was so happy and we had finally achieved our goal. <clears throat> By going on this adventure, Bertha and her sons had completed the world's first road trip in a car. More importantly, she's considered to be the first female driver in the world. Wow. And the era, you think back then, um, you know, how common it was to see a woman (laughs) behind controls of a, you know, Mm -hmm. stagecoach or a carriage. I mean, sure, it happens, especially on a small farm when the wife had to go in and get supplies. But in a city setting or generally speaking, I mean, it was typically a male. Well, yeah, that's the sad thing is that women did things back then, but history just kind of glossed over it Mm -hmm. and they got forgotten. We're just now really discovering this again and you only what's really said you only really discover it when it's like this when you're actually really digging for information yeah and that's the, that's 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 a terrible thing it's too bad it wasn't uh you know more transparent uh, the way information has been mm-hmm. presented in the past it was not for her daring and resource, resourceful exploit the automobile as we may know it may have never become a common reality the most eventful part of the trip was when a crowd of people who had been watching the car approach from a distance swarmed bertha and the boys when they stopped <clears throat> These were literally the first people in the world to see a car driving on regular roads. Only horses had been seen before that point. So it was just like it's like a spaceship coming through, essentially. Uh, yeah. Just just about, or yeah. some type of witchcraft or voodoo. Yeah, yeah you know? exactly. Yeah, but probably. Yeah. After Bertha had proved her husband's invention did have real world potential, he set to work again and produced an improved third version of the car via via Bertha's suggestions from her drive. <clears throat> 
With most of the engineering solved, the next hurdle would be marketing. It was hard to convince people they no longer needed to rely off horses. The fuel needed to use horses was ready available, that being hay and water. Benzene was not. Yeah, I mean, you think about that, how how far, how much of a gap there is between pharmacies, depending on your road of travel <laughs> back then. I mean, a few and far between, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah imagine if we still went to the pharmacy to get gas. Hey, can, yeah, can you get me uh, <laughs> my prescription and, and, and some gasoline? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you just fill up the jug for me here? I brought my empty with me. <laughs> to help boost sales, the car was presented at the Munich um, Engineering Exposition. Carl would end up winning an award for his invention. Unfortunately, this did not help improve sales. Things would improve was when the car was showcased at the Paris equivalent of the Munich show. The fashionable French were fascinated with this new machine and thought there could be a future in the motor carriage. <clears throat> By 1892, a dozen Benz cars had been sold, and the company now had 430 employees. Uh, sales began to pick up. Only 25 three-wheeled cars were built before Carl decided to switch to a four-wheel design. <clears throat> the model that followed the original car, the Velo, is considered to be the world's first production car. Uh, 1,200 in total were produced, and it would be entered into the world's first automobile race in 1894, 1894 the Paris to Rhone. Oh, wow. <clears throat> and, my, and those races, that's, that's a whole episode on itself. Uh, absolutely. But, I was just going to say that's yeah. a trigger right there. We could talk a lot about that. Yeah, but literally, they're, they're racing on open roads with traffic. Yeah. <laughs> God. I, that will be another episode. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yes. uh, The Benz Company would continue to thrive for the next two decades until the Great Depression struck Germany. Uh, the nation had just lost the First World War, and an economic depression was the last thing anyone wanted. With financial problems growing, the Benz Company had to merge with Daimler and Maybach. <clears throat> the company would eventually take on a customer named Emil Jenik, uh, Yelnik maybe is how they pronounce it, who was a wealthy businessman who had many friends in high places, including the Rothschild family. Oh. When the company produced an exceptionally powerful 35-horsepower model designed by William Maybach and Paul Daimler, Yelnick requested the car be named after his daughter, Mercedes. Of course. Here we go. <laughs> and that, as they say, the rest is history. Well, it's just uh, its amazing. You know, <laughs> just the story in itself, it's amazing the... Uh, the evolution of the names and how that changed on its own. I mean, that's always some of the most fascinating features. And yeah, Mercedes Benz, you know, which uh, is it Daimler now? Is that their official? Mm -hmm. or are, they, are they Mercedes Benz? I know they're they're changing their name again or were, yeah, but that is the oldest car company. Plain and simple because of this. But if you trace the history back, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's, I mean, you think about after they had established things and started production, how many other people in the you know relative area started jumping on i mean again that's another show on its own but they were the first mm -hmm. i mean they were truly the first to make some of these breakthroughs all right and i wrote down some other um interesting facts on this too none of the uh, production models of the bins Patton motor wagon survive they're all that none of them there's none left oh wow so any 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 you do see like in tv or if you're lucky enough to see something in a museum it's a replica um that's i guess you know, again, that's terrible with yeah, some of that so, stuff. Yeah, all, yeah, I've written down here. All examples are replicas, including even the ones they put on display at the Mercedes headquarters. Oh, so, wow. yeah, yeah, so <sighs> kind of sad. Uh, cost of the car. Not a lot of records were kept, but it may have cost about $1,000 um, when you adjust everything, which is about 26000 in, in today's money. Today's money. Yeah. Okay. So, it, I mean, yeah, it that's a lot of money for uh, basically what was kind of a toy back then, but not as much as I was I thought it would be. Yeah, I actually <clears throat> would have thought a little bit more. I mean, making it more out of the reach of the, I guess, for what it's worth. This is a loose term, the middle class of that day, if there was such a thing. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it wasn't completely the just nothing but the upper class creme de la creme, you know, that could afford such mm -hmm. a invention. <clears throat> now, the, the bin's... The Benz Motor Wagon is considered the first car by most, you know, automotive historians. But there were other things that did pr vehicles that preceded it. Uh, the first self-propelled propelled vehicle was created by a Frenchman who was Nicolas Joseph uh, Cuneau. 
It was a steam-powered vehicle that was completed in 1769 for the French military. I think they used it to carry cannons. Oh, that would make sense. Yeah, especially larger, heavier, you know, (laughs) artillery. Yeah. Why we don't really hear about that a lot, even though it was the first uh, vehicle, essentially. It was so heavy that it was not practical for everyday use. It was just a huge tractor tank, basically. Yeah. (laughs) Now, this I found interesting. In 1881, the first electric-powered vehicle was introduced. It was invented by Frenchman Gustave Trouvé when he took an electric motor developed by Siemens and installed it in a tricycle built by Englishman James Starley. Why isn't that not considered the first car was what I was wondering. Uh, Yeah, that really makes you, that throws you for a loop thinking about that. Back then, it's electric. (laughs) They don't even acknowledge it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh. Well, that's making a comeback, so maybe he, that, that guy will become more known in the future. So. Uh, you would think, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, especially yep. as we develop more and more and, and look back for the you know the origins mm-hmm. of this tech. But on to, you know, more directly with um, modern Mercedes. You know, I, this, this is just my opinion, um, but I, I, never, I never thought Mercedes made an ugly car. But for the longest time, I never thought they made a pretty car. They kind of fall right in between in a lot of ways, um, and especially, you know, even going back over the eras where you had some of the big, more grandiose front ends and, you know, the rounded designs, especially of the 1950s with the SL series. Um, yeah, it kind of it's kind of one of those that I don't know. I mean, when you get to current day, it's so radically different, you know, but when you think about the eras that we're talking about and even postmodern era, um you know, pre-modern, it's just, uh, yeah, it kind of falls in between. Yeah, I've always been more of a Jag man, you know, that I had mm-hmm. one. But I really like these new, new Mercedes. I think they look great. I think it was before the pandemic, I went to the Portland Auto Show, I actually sat and just, it was just like the C-Class. You know, it was, it was the smallest one, but the the interior was gorgeous, too. I mean, it's, I don't know, it just, I, I it's a... This is my opinion once again, but it's, it's a vast improvement over what it used to be. What it used to be, yeah. 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 <laughs> and, you know, and I think a, a lot of it comes with uh, the materials. They figured out how to make consistent quality where, you know, back in the day, again, you look at the 1980s and even with Mercedes, I mean, it was expensive. It was the quality of the time, but it just didn't last and some of it didn't hold up, even in its, in its era. You know, I mean, some of the leathers and, so, you know, just, again, materials, everything's gotten a lot better in a lot yeah. of ways. Yeah. And it's nice to see manufacturers that uh, take advantage of that. Mm-hmm. Have you ever driven one? Uh, yes, I have. I've driven a number of Mercedes. In fact, uh, my folks, um, my mom was big into them, and my dad was as well. Uh, some of the 300D series from the early 1980s. My dad was really big in the Mercedes diesel cars. Um, he was a diesel guy, though, so I mean, he always liked the mileage. And those were, those were pretty dog. I mean, they only were around. God, I think it was like 65 horsepower, but uh, the mileage was great back then. Of course, it was a diesel. I think they were getting upwards of like 40 miles a gallon, late, high 30s, you know, low 40s at most. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, no, I've also driven some of the 500 SL, uh, you know, famed series, the 500 SL series from the 1980s, which were their flagship car. Um, you're looking at a car, you know, back then that was, I think, around uh, mid 50s is what those retailed for in the 1980s, and. Uh, they are. They're smooth. Um, you know, even if you don't like the looks, they did ride very smooth, very stable. Um, and you could see the appeal. I mean, especially back then. And the thing with Mercedes that's changed over time but stays consistent to an extent is the the logo. You have that big Benz mm-hmm. logo. And especially throughout certain areas like the 1950s and 1980s, it was very prominent. You know, they had that yeah, right up yeah. front. You couldn't mistake it. So My, my understanding of that logo, too, is that that – the, those three points of the star it was supposed to represent the the engines that were built for cars ships and airplanes oh interesting <laughs> yeah. the three points mm-hmm. yeah no i've driven on a lot of things you know jags porsches I've just about all you know qu- quite a bit but oddly enough i've never driven a mercedes so i really need to have that to my list especially after listening to this story so <laughs> oh yeah and i mean they <laughs> Talk about, you know, you look over the different, the decades, especially, you know, from the 1950s spreading into the early 2000s. What a vast variety. I mean, you have everywhere from just a slow economy car that's comfortable and and, and has its purpose to an absolute supercar, Um, you know, so. You know, I was having this this spirited debate with a guy I know, and we were talking about if if we could only choose one brand to buy from for the rest of your life. 
And he chose Nissan. Okay. Interesting. And then I said Mercedes. And he goes, why? I said, they make every single kind of wheeled vehicle you would ever need. (laughs) They make everything from small commuter cars to big freight trucks and vans. (laughs) That is is true. (laughs) And they are still the manufacturer of those. It hasn't been outsourced like some of my favorite previous brands, Volvo, you know, yeah. um, where they still make the big trucks. But anyways, uh, that is a good point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what a range. All right. I think we're going to bring things to a close now, Adam. Uh, the hint for our next episode is it doesn't have wheels. It doesn't have skis. And it doesn't have wings. Ooh. Mm. Well, that's got well, the wheels turning. We're going to find out, right? Or not so much the wheels turning. We'll see. We'll see you next time. <laughs> All right. Once again, we're on Patreon. We appreciate your support. Please give us a good review. We like those. And we will catch you next time. Next time we'll be there. All right. Signing out. Star, star.